now we launch into Candice. I'm really nervous. <laughs> I really <laughs> have been so excited for um, this podcast because she's very important to me as an actress and an activist um, and someone who's just given um, a lot of time to speaking about um, the importance of diversity and representation in the media. But I wanted to contextualize this conversation first with a bit of TV history, because I feel like when people don't know like what she walked into, they're like, well, I mean, everybody was dealing with harassment. I'm like, it was 2014 when The Flash premiered. But prior to that, like Kara Washington um, was in Scandal, which started in 2012, and she became the first Black woman in 38 years to be the lead of a primetime show on a, on a network television. Then you had Nicole Bahari and Sleepy Hollow in 2013, and Viola Davis and How to Get Away with Murder in 2014. So you have these um, Black female leads on network TV all at once, you know, um, dealing with this really for the first time in a, in a really long time. And you have Candace doing genre. Nicole was doing genre too, um, but like this is genre on the CW. And Nicole's role, Nicole Bahari's role in Sleep with Hollow, like that's, she originated it. It's not the same as Candace stepping into a role, which has traditionally been played by a white woman. And like, I couldn't even imagine stepping into that whirlwind of chaos, of being excited you got the part. But then before this show even airs, there are angry fans online because a character was race bent. It's sight unseen. They hadn't seen the show. They didn't know what they were going to be doing on the show, but had already decided it had failed out of the gate. And then to be on the receiving end of that while you're trying to promote the show, like I can't even imagine how that would feel. It's wild to think about now looking back on it because yeah 2014 still feels very modern but at the same time so much has happened since then and that just put in context how big the flash was back then there were there were no marvel shows there were very few superhero shows the flash uh, not only eclipsed arrow but it went on to become one of the biggest tv shows of all time so all that conversation that was going on prior to the show's debut uh, obviously got maximized when it hit the screens and so Candace was, I don't want to say subjected, but automatically open to that bigger audience after The Flash debuted. And obviously so much good came from that, but a lot of bad came from that as well. And it's just shocking to think about now, in a time as modern as 2014, that was even a conversation. But like I said, even progress has changed since then. But the fact that it was a conversation back then, it's still shocking to me. And like you said, Sabrina, it's like, imagine being so excited that you got this breakout role, this breakthrough role, probably the biggest of her career thus far, I would imagine. And then just being flooded with people being angry on principle because it's not what they had imagined. And though I don't know if those people realized, I'm sure some of them realized that their hate stemmed from racism, but some of them probably didn't even realize that some of the things they were saying you can be protective of a property that you really love, but like some of the things that you're, that they, they were throwing at Candace was like, that's not okay. Like, that's not like, just realize what you're saying. Like it's, it didn't need to be that deep. Like, I don't know. I just, my heart breaks when I think about how excited she must've been to get this role. And then it's just like, oh, people are mad at me and they don't know me. I don't know. It just breaks my heart to think about that. Yeah, cause you can't talk about the flash without also talking about what Candace Patton went through and continues to go through. Um, but like in 2014, like you have this, as she would put it, this ingenue, right? She's, she's, she's just stepped into the spotlight in a major role um, in a situation like Michael, you said, where there's no, there's no like Marvel TV. Like this is, this is, everyone is learning as they go about how to handle this um, when it comes to the television audience. And then the studios failed her and the network failed her about protecting her. Um, and granted, this has a lot to do with no one really knowing how to navigate social media because around this time, it was really still new for, for um, actors and artists to be online and interacting that closely with fans in a way they had never done before. And you've got like marketing teams where like, no, the engagement is great. The engagement is great. It doesn't matter if it's negative. And like, but then you're trying to remind them that 
but I'm a person behind the account and you want me to interact, but you want me to ignore them, but you don't want to step in and tell them to knock it off or to block people. Or when she was talking on the Open Up podcast, um, that's Elliot Knight's podcast. She was saying like she even had, her publishers had to ask the Flash Twitter account to follow her. Like in, for some people, like the grand scheme of things that's small, but like when you're the one who singled out the only person who wasn't followed, it's like one thing in a line of things that just make you feel unwelcome. But when you're on a show that has, as I don't want to say rabbit, but as passionate a fan base as a show like this, like, or at least it did back in the day, of course, they're going to notice something like that. So again, that could draw more ire, more controversy, more criticism that she didn't deserve towards her. So the fact that not only that she had to ask, but that her publicist or her team had to ask on her behalf on like social media, so professional social media can should automatically follow the whole cast. So of course it's going to look like she was singled out and no one could blame her for feeling like that. And especially when you're under such a microscope, like the, the kind that the flash would have provided in 2014, of course, people are going to notice that. And this isn't just like a TV show where they're like, Oh, any publicity is good publicity. There are real people behind this. And she was unfortunately at the center of a lot of that. Even criticism sounds like too light of a word. There was a lot of hate unfairly directed towards her. I don't feel like the or the protocols were in place to protect her from that. No, they didn't have a plan. Like they mm-hmm. just like, and this is around the time I think people still do have um like they're contractually obligated to interact on their social media platforms, um, with the emphasis being on Twitter. And so then like you have you have to do it. Like it's it's not a choice. Just like they have to do, a lot of times they have to do the interviews, at least in the first promo cycle. So then you're dealing with that as well, which is why I loved uh, the development of the Iris West Defense Squad. Now that is a deep cut for those who were not around back in 2014, but when the flash aired and there were a lot of fans who noticed that the way Candace was being treated treated, they decided to form a defense squad on social media and they would um, tweet so that she'd be trending every time the flash would come out. So Iris West would trend, I believe Candace Patton would trend as well, um, to show so that they could show that, you know, there are a lot of like evil and mean and messed up people because some of the comments that were left were very sick. Um, but there are fans who love you and who appreciate this character and want to see you thrive. And like, we got you. Um, we will be in the trenches. Um, ex- some of them, I think, even expose some fans to like the fact that, like, you know, you're being racist, right? Like, you know, this is not OK. Right. And she's like she's done nothing to deserve this. And no one deserves any of the comments that you're saying. I love the Iris West Defense Squad. It is a deep cut. I remember them. I, I the first I wasn't on social media during the first season of the show, so I was oblivious to a lot of what was going on. And it was only around the time of the second season that I came, came across them. And they saw that me after an article I wrote and said how lovely it was. And then I got to know them, got to know why they existed. And for someone who was completely unaware, because not only not only you not being on social media, but living in a different part of the world and not seeing those conversations, learning about it retroactively, it was shocking. But like even that feels like such a long time ago because it's hard to say retroactively now when I've been a part of that fandom from like season two onwards and I have seen it play out in real time, a season after season, season after season, storyline after storyline. And of course, the negativity is still there, but it's lovely to see that the Iris West Defense Squad is still there and what they've involved into and what their new uh, motivations and motives are. The motivations said the same, but they always come up with new movements, new uh, chapters off it. And it's sad that they have to keep doing that. Like, sometimes it feels like their voices aren't being heard. But as someone who didn't hear, didn't know they existed, I heard their voices loud and clear when, when I crossed paths with them. So it's lovely to see that they, they are still a thing, regardless of how the movements evolved. I just feel like that kind of positivity was necessary and I hope that Candace knew about it and that it was a driving force for her to stay on because she was inspiring so much love out there. I was going to say, it's so incredible to hear about that because I had no idea about that until now. But as incredible as it, as it is, like on the other side, it's like, how sad is that that they had to even do that? Like, it's amazing. Like, of course, you need to lift anybody up that's getting any kind of hate, but like, I don't know, just like, just thinking about that, like, they had to band together to like, make noise that's louder than the hate. It's, it's horrible what social media can be. 
It is. And then when Candace was talking on that podcast, she was saying that she can't even watch like the show. And that doesn't um, automatically apply to like the harassment she got, but it was so bad that she wanted to leave um before season two like it was just like and she only stayed one because <laughs> contracts and two um because she knew how important the role is so then you have fans who are being awful but then you have like set situations that are also not great like she doesn't watch the show because when she looks at an episode she'll know what happened on set that day because she dealt with like a lot of microaggressions and she was saying like everyone was starting from a learning place, but like you actually have to want to learn. And so like having to steal yourself to be prepared to have to fight for the things that you need is hard. And she does it, she did it, she continues to do it. She talks about it in um, her interviews whenever she does do an interview, whenever she does do a panel, which by the way, that is why I have a bone to pick with people who are up in um, the Twitter comments of when those articles came out about um, CW not protecting her from harassment from fans. When they were, there are people who were like, well, she never said anything. Like, Candace Patton has been talking about this since 2014. She talked about um, the way fans were treating her. She talked about how she needed more support on set. She's talked about how you need to hire people in production who can do um you can do black hair um makeup for black women like the um to have people in the writer's room to have people behind the camera like it's much more than you hire um this one person who's going to like break boundaries like you have to protect those people and they were not doing that and the cw has improved with that over the years they're still not the best at it and you do have um you do have stars coming out and saying like, yeah, um, we had to have a few discussions about this, that, and next. But because she held the door open, you have, she's able to give the support to them that she didn't have because it was just her. Mm, definitely. And that's what bothers me about a lot of people saying that she never talked about this before. I remember during the show, show's third season, fourth season, this conversation would come up. I think the thing that's changed is that she's gotten less afraid to talk about it. And she keeps saying more now every time she does. And as she should say as much as she needs to, because the fact that she still has to at this point in time is shocking. Especially, I think the one thing that resonated shockingly a lot of, with a lot of people was the fact that this has been this stems back as far as season one because everyone thinks of the show in season one as this kind of like energetic exciting game changer and the cast was so bubbly and light and young and fun at the time whereas now it seems like they're kind of just going through the motions with the show as as any long-running show does but the fact that you can look back at that bubbly first season and now know what was going on behind the scenes and that it wasn't all light and fun and bubbly that's heartbreaking especially for someone like the leading lady who was in most of the scenes like the fact that she's now stuck it out now that we know she's stuck in that for now what's going to be nine seasons testament testament to her and congratulations to her for wanting to further that movement and increase the representation on the network and continue to inspire people but she shouldn't have had to have done it for that long in that environment the environment should have been cleared up long ago and the fact that it's still a conversation now nearly a decade later is just unbelievable I completely understand where she's coming from with like wanting to remove yourself from a situation that's not good for you, but also being like, well, crap, my presence is bigger than myself. Um, and also, I did want to say, look, I'm we all know everyone here knows I'm an Arrowverse outsider. Like, I don't know anything about this uh, fandom series, anything. But even I caught wind of this at some point in the show's run like I feel like any time that her name came up unfortunately it was like I was like oh okay she was the one that was getting unfortunate and un un unnecessary hate online I didn't know the depth of it I didn't know like what it was about but somehow that was creeping into like my timeline even though I wasn't like seeking out information and content about the Arrowverse like that. It was always something that I was like aware of peripherally. Um, and then when I did, I saw that Twitter thread um, that compiled like everything that she had said and to, to hear that people are like, Oh, she never talked about it. Just to hear her explain her experience. There's video and there's quotes. She's spoken about this openly and honestly and frankly, like, just because you don't like what she's saying 
doesn't make it any less true. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Unfortunately, people hear things and they're like, oh, that's, she's being dramatic. And it's like, well, listen to what she's saying. Just because it, maybe it's reflecting poorly on what you actually think about the situation. And you should listen to what she's saying. I think it's because it, it challenges um, what people want, which is they want it to be fun and bubbly and for everyone to have gotten along and for um, one of their favorite shows to not have had an issue behind the scenes. But to be frank, The Flash has had an issue on camera. <laughs> like it just has, like there's just, we are, we've gone through eight seasons um, and I was thinking about this as I was preparing for the podcast. I don't think I can name a single season where Candace was given um, a storyline that was consistent. Like she's had great moments. She's had storylines that were great. But if we're talking about all the way through the season, they have struggled writing for Iris um, since the beginning. And I think a lot of it had to do with their inability to um, extract her from Barry's storyline and, and let her be a reporter. It really confused me in season one after they had talked so much, um, the fandom had talked so much about like how much of a reporter Iris is. And she's basically up there with Lois Lane um, that like I was having a dissertation and it had nothing to do with journalism. <laughs> and I was like, mm -hmm. wait, why are we starting out the gate this way? And if we're starting out the gate this way, where is her story about falling in love with journalism? And you get there through Barry and that's fine, but it's like, it, it's had its stops and starts and it's always had its stops and starts. And that has been bothersome as a viewer for me. See, I'm like confused because I did watch, I don't remember how many episodes of season one, but I did watch it when it premiered. I have no memory of it, if I'm being honest. Um, but as the season series went on, it was my assumption that they were co-leads, male lead, female lead. She had her own thing going on. And I guess I also was ignorant that I didn't know exactly what was happening with the show. But like, why would I keep up with the show that I don't watch? Um, but that's just always been my assumption that she was second on the call. She she's second in command. Like she has her own storyline in the show. And to hear that that's not the case and that they, she was just kind of thrown around. That's really disheartening. Mm, definitely. And it's interesting looking back now because I know season one definitely had its issues with how it handled her, but I do understand as far from a story standpoint, it had to focus on that little team flash bubble while it built up towards her finding out. But the whole Iris and the flash dynamic, that was wonderful. And you're like, why couldn't you have taken that and built upon that and done something wonderful? I don't really remember what she had to do in season two. In season three, she was notoriously portrayed as the damsel in distress. And then they try to make up for that in season four by making her the leader of team flash, which is great. You're leading ladies on screen all the time but she wasn't in the storyline she should have been where it was this passion for journalism that the show promised the fans consistently over the years it was going to give her and then even though she is now where she needs to be it feels like an awful lot of that happened off screen and that's mm -hmm. not right it could have shown her build of that empire now she's suddenly like the cat grant of central city and that she has this empire but all the fans offer wanted her to see her build that and I I think that's a disservice to obviously Candace Patton because she would have nailed that material but it's a disservice to the Iris West character because you know how iconic journalism is to her and it's a disservice to the show because it doesn't know how to utilize its female leading lady and that is not right we shouldn't be having this conversation eight seasons later can I ask a question that we may or may not know the answer to mm -hmm. sure are there any women in the writer's room for the flash that is something to Google because I'm actually not sure. I know that CW over the years have been taken to task about um, the lack of diversity amongst gender and races in their writer's room, especially um, when it came to DCTV. I'm actually not sure if there are any women or have been any women in the Flash writer's room. I don't remember. I, I see. I feel like it's harder to follow with that because the Flash Riders Room used to have a Twitter account and then about six years ago it stopped, it stopped being active and I think it's gone now. So I don't actually know. It's very hard to keep up to date with what happens behind the scenes on the Flash, but that's a good point. Maybe that is part of the issue. I don't know if it is or not. I don't want to assume, but yeah, I do feel like this show has struggled dramatically and like not to compare shows, 
But like, all you have to do is look at how Superman at Lois utilizes Lois Lane in every single episode. Sometimes she's in the super story. Sometimes she's in the Smallville realistic story. Sometimes she has this wonderful female friendship with Lana. I just feel like the Flash has failed Iris in all of those categories. And it wouldn't have been that hard to nail it because at the end of the day, Yes, Superman at Lois is of a higher standard, but these shows do follow similar formats. And if one show can nail it, there's absolutely no reason the other one couldn't have. And it was very close to doing so many times. It just consistently dropped the ball. Yeah. And one of those balls is um, the fact that she doesn't ever really have friends. Like, they'll come in. Um, they tried to force one with Caitlin and that wasn't working. Um, and I think like when she had the Central City Citizen, I was so happy because then you have um, Allegra and I'm so sorry, I don't remember her, the photographer's name, um, but that whole dynamic was wonderful. Uh, and I appreciated it so much. It took forever to get there, but I appreciated it. Yeah, so did I. And it was nice to see that little subplot. But then I think that brought up the, uh, again, the same issue that like with Riverdale would have where it pockets characters off. And then Iris mm-hmm. suddenly started to feel disconnected from the major story. And so much so that the night Cisco was leaving, wasn't it? The photographer was Cisco's girlfriend, wasn't it? Camilla, isn't that right? Um, oh, yes. Uh, so much know that the night Cisco and Camilla were leaving, Iris had a separate party with Camilla while Team Flash had a separate party with Cisco. And I get the idea in theory, but Iris knew Cisco for far longer. Should she not have been at his leaving party as well? They were very close when she was the leader of Team Flash. I just feel like this show is not built. Of, it, of course, it's been very careful building friendships for Barry because understandably he's at the focus of the show, but so is Iris. And some of those friendships come and go. Like, for example, Iris was a wonderful addition to the Frost episode after Frost died. I, Iris uh, bonded with Frost's mom, but it was hard to take some of that seriously because they talked about how Frost and Iris had this friendship and you never saw that on screen. And I know there are issues about why they did this and why they didn't do that, but I just feel like that highlighted the show's inability to build friendships for Iris. And you need to remember that she's not just this person that can be pocketed off into a second leading story. She needs to be the lead, the co-lead of the main story as well. And again, that just feels like one of the many injustices they've done the character. It's one of my least favorite TV tropes. I have to speak on it. I'm sorry. Um, and it's just, I'm going to be honest, lazy writing. When they they always do that with women characters, they just like, it's because of proximity. They're like, oh, they don't really get along, but they're in the same space. They would obviously be friends. And it's like, that's not always the case. And it's mm-hmm. unfair to do that. It happens in so many shows. I wish I had an example prepared, but I feel like I see it so often. I'm like, they would never like, be close friends like they're just acquaintances Mm -hmm. why would you do that (laughs) Mm -hmm. and the for iris it has only recently been been more organic to like her personality so like yes read with the example for the flash would have been caitlin those two would never be friends and that is okay like um but like they forced it for a little bit until they just quit um, but like, yes, she'd be friends with Ryan Wilder. Like, yes, she'd be friends with Sue Dearborn. Like they're, they fit her personality. They're both bosses. Um, and they lighten her up. Like Iris is fun, but she also over the years has become so serious because so much trauma and tragedy has happened. So um, having best friends that um, bring a levity to her, but are also fiercely protective of her um, is important. Without a doubt. And I think that was, we, it's well established what we feel about season eight, but I feel like that was one of the silver linings of it was the Iris and Sue friendship. Of course, in the back half of season eight, it, did, it was non-existent. Sue would pop up to stand in the background of scenes and not have a single line of dialogue. But the Sue and Iris friendship was so unexpected. And like, where has this been? When was Sue introduced? Season five, season six. Why couldn't we have done this sooner? Or why couldn't we have done this sooner with Iris with a different character? It's just, it was nice to see her have her own story but it became so separate. It's like, we can't possibly include her in the main story. So much so that when they did, Sue became a background character. And it's just, Sue was such a great addition to the show, but she got so much better when she was a friend of Iris. And that's because the writing, dare I say, served them well. So why couldn't it have done that so much sooner? Was Sue in the episode I watched? Uh, no. no. Okay. I was like, do I know Sue? <laughs> <laughs> but did you see the clip of Iris making someone disappear like Thanos? No. No. Okay. Because like Sue was in that one. So if you saw, um, 
I have, Serena, I have seen nothing about the show except, except for the finale of season eight that I watched out of context. <laughs> okay, we'll table that. I will I will message you a picture of Sue so cool, you can okay. take, put a face to the lady. She's a badass. She is. She's amazing. And again, I hope she's in season nine. Me too. Um, Me that'd too. That'd be so great. Um, I think, have I lost the thread of where we were at? I think I have a little bit. So I want to um, circle to um, a point that I wanted to make about um, Candace being the one who is ushered in mm-hmm. all these Black women superheroes or if we were um, in genre fiction, just because she's held the door open. Um, I know some people are like, she just arrived. It's like, yeah, that's the point. She was successful in um, a genre show and therefore networks and studios were like, you know what? This seems like a formula that would work. I think she's the reason why um, Marvel was like, we can make an MJ who's black. Therefore, let's do the Zendaya. And that worked. Um, there's Casey Clemens, who's in the DCU in the Snyderverse, um, as Michael told me, because I was like, I, it was a deleted scene. Did they show her later? Like, um, but I know she's Iris West in, in The Flash. Um, Anna Diop as Starfire in Titans, Divisio Leslie, obviously, as Ryan Wilder in Batwoman. Um, AZ to Michael, did I pronounce it Tesfai? I believe name? so. Yes, I believe so. Um, AZ Tesfai as Guardian and Supergirl. And then, of course, Casey Waffle in um, the short lived Naomi, which HBO Max, again, do not know why you didn't pick that show up. And Nefessa Williams is Thunder and Black Lightning. Look. It's so easy to get like uh, pulled into the negativity part of this because Candace has been through the ringer and she should never have been. But I, I, I do feel like it's important to step back and look, look at the representation that she has held the door open for, not just on this network, but in the genre. And it's wonderful to say every time she did a live with some of these actresses that you just mentioned, it was always interesting to hear it from their perspective. And I think the one underlining thing in most of those videos was that how none of them would be in the roles they are or were in this day and age without Candace holding the door open for them. And I think, yes, Iris West isn't a superhero, but I don't, I, I feel like a lot of people let that slide and like, oh, don't overlook that or do overlook that, excuse me, and th- say that she didn't have to wear a costume or she did, she wasn't the lead, le- the main lead of the show, which again is Robba. She is the co lead of the show. But the fact of the matter is, Iris West Allen was the leading lady of the biggest superhero show at the time of all time. And then look at look at that wealth of diversity and representation that followed her. And for anyone to overlook that would be just, it, it, it would be so naive, it would be so ignorant to ignore the impact she has had in this genre. And I, I hope, I'm glad that Candace continues on because while the hit comes and goes, while a lot of these new projects come and go, Iris West has stood the test of time, not to use a flash pawn, but Iris West has absolutely stood the test of time. And I think that is a testament to Iris, but more so it's a testament to Candace. And I'm glad we're living in an era with this growth and representation, with this growth and diversity. And as the superhero genre continues to spiral into unreachable heights because it's continuing to get bigger i'm not sure it would be there without the flash but i know for a fact the diversity within that universe would not be there without the flash and more importantly without candace Patton. and i think that's absolutely wonderful i'm sure to a lot of little girls she is a superhero exactly Just because we haven't seen a, a photo of a little girl and candace in the same outfit like we have with like what Brie Larson and Captain Marvel or whatever I feel like we see those all the time just because she doesn't wear a suit doesn't mean she wasn't inspiring to a little girl who was like oh I can see myself on screen through Candace Mm -hmm. and Iris exactly and also she is a hero like she doesn't have to wear a suit to be one like she's central she's central city's hero in a way that she makes sure to uplift the community like she mm-hmm. really when they do the journalism aspect for her right she's a symbol of someone who um thinks it's important that it's not just the voices of those in authority that we hear but the voices who run on the street those in the community those who are um on the front lines every day in Central City, seeing things go down, seeing how how um, life is for them. And that's why I appreciate her so much, to be honest. I mean, I also call her um, Iris Deadshot West Allen 
um, because you don't want to mess with her in a fight either. Like she doesn't have powers, but she can ruin your day. Like whether it's with a gun or whatever she has on hand, she's going to mess up your life if you mess up hers. And it's just amazing when Candace gets to do action sequences because she's so good at them. Oh, without a doubt. Now I've, uh, it's well established that I do not like season four, but one of my favorite things about season four was the amount of like promo shots or trailers or even episodes where you'd see Candace holding that long gun because they, they, because Iris had been hardened by the effects of the previous season. She started to learn to defend herself better and you could clearly see the writing team was trying to make up for turning her into a damsel in distress in the season beforehand. And that to me was one of my favorite parts about season four. And to go back to the whole, whether she's a superhero or not, you don't need superpowers to be a superhero you don't need a costume to be a superhero but i will say one of the best parts about season four is that they give iris superpowers and a costume <laughs> yes. um even if it wasn't that horrible the hotness episode but the fact of the matter is oh not him but the fact of the matter is iris shot him down iris put out that fire iris cooled that hotness and as she should as exactly she should. exactly one of the best parts about the flash put out one of the worst parts about the flash um, <laughs> And again, you see in what was it, the season seven finale, again, season seven, not one of the better parts of the Flash, but like the Speed Force whips, uh, flicks her fingers and all of them are suddenly in costume again, including Iris. I do like that they have that thing to go to if they need to, not that they should have to fight the whole Iris isn't a superhero argument. She is a superhero, but like if you need a costume and speed to prove it, we have that on the back burner and that's great for them. But I just feel like Candace nails action as well. And it would be nice to see more of that. Don't get me wrong. I'm the very person who said I want to see Iris reporting and doing what she's good at. But when they need to, to lean on that, I'm glad they can because it's just, it's great to see her in that outfit. It's great to see her with speed, just like Barry. And it's great to see her thrive on screen, whatever, it, whatever she is doing. And I know we're going to talk about her favorite scenes from her, but like I, I've talked about season four and I feel like I can't let the conversation go without mentioning that epic showdown that uh, Iris had with the Vos wife. And it was, I love my husband more than you love yours. And then mm -hmm. Iris proved that she, no, no, in fact, and then it got um, Marlena, was that her name? Marlena DeVoe to stab herself, to stab Iris. Iris stabbed herself with Marlena's weapon so that she could hit the button and bring herself closer to the thinker's chair and ultimately knock her out. So just the, the depths Iris was willing to go to to save Barry that uh, the flash has had some gems over the years and that was one of them and candace absolutely thrived in that scene she did i think since we're talking about epic iris moments anyway um we might as well just <laughs> like just launch into more of them my well some of my favorite ones of course is when she gets to fight but also when she gets to shoot so like when she stops avatar um that was an amazing cut um because he was run, he was about to start charging at Barry, and then she shot him, and that man was done for the count. He evaporated, um, kind of like the snap. It was mm -hmm. it was amazing. Um, it also, Mirror Iris, that storyline took a long time, but that fight sequence where she's attacking Barry is absolutely amazing. You could tell Candace had fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, the T-1000 could never. Iris went all Terminator in that moment. That, that was an epic moment. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the shooting of uh, Savitar dying, it didn't make up for the damsel in distress season that we had to endure before that. But the, the, that beautiful line she had at the end, all this time you were trying to save me and look at that, I saved you. I was like, yes, Iris. I wish we had more <laughs> of those moments, but my goodness, was that one worth the wait? Yes, or um, when she jumped off the roof to go save Barry. Oh. Uh, that was epic. Um, I also like her softer moments um, when we got out of the mirror storyline and she was struggling with talking about what happened to her. And she has that great moment where she does stand up and um, she talks about her own experience as, as loosely as she possibly can. But you can tell it meant a lot for her to finally be able to get um, the words out about how, just how hurtful the whole experience was and how traumatic the experience was. I, th I think that was, I remember watching season seven and I'm kind of like, I'm muted. I'm like, oh, okay, we're doing this, we're doing that. That brought me out of that feeling. That was such a powerful moment. And 
the fact uh, Candace absolutely nailed it from a performance standpoint. She had some great dialogue to work with too. And it, that again, I hate to keep going back to that, but it's always the glimmers of what Iris could have been if they if they stop giving her crumbs and start giving her full blown meals because she she really makes the most of the scene she's given. And I just wish she had they could have followed on from that a little bit more. But my goodness, what a powerful scene that was. Can I just, just say that, and I know I told you guys this, but when I watched the season eight finale, she was my favorite part of the episode. And that is an objective opinion that was not influenced by anything. It was just anytime she was on screen, I was like, what? And I was like, <laughs> that was when I was the most focused because she was just so good. And it was really compelling to watch her perform. Yeah, she is the best actor, period on The Flash. And then it's Grant Gustin for me. Um, I know it's his show first, but for me, um, Candace is just, when they give her what she should be given, the breadth of what she brings to the storyline is just amazing, which is why when she said on Open Up um, that she doesn't know where she, what type of performance she would have given if she didn't also have to wade through trauma to get her performances out. And I'm just like, girl, you're already stunning mm -hmm. on The Flash. I mean, how much more could your roles be elevated? <laughs> um, but if she feels that way, I just, that makes me want to see her in another project. Like, what is Candace going to be giving us when she closes the door on The Flash and steps into a new role. I mean, Hollywood better be ready because um, the awards feel like they're going to have to be given. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see what she does next because obviously, like, um, it's a lot to get into the flash now. Like, I don't know if that's something that I would personally do, but I do want to like follow her career and see what she does next. And I could see her getting into like being a producer and taking on that mm -hmm. kind of role and like having a voice and being an advocate for younger black women coming into the industry because she's been through it and I'm sure she wants to be able to care for others and foster that talent and continue to open doors not just like crack the door open but like swing it open and put the doorstop down and be like come on in we're gonna do this together um I don't want to place any like expectations on her like if that's not something that she wants to pursue like I want to like backtrack and just be like, she can do whatever she wants to do, obviously. But that's just like from an outside perspective. I'd like, I really hope that if that is something that she ever would want to pursue, it would be so exciting to watch her do that because I know she would be amazing at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, she's already knocked down so many walls and not they're not walls that an actor on a show should have had to knock down, but her voice has been so powerful as far as things like that go. And it would be incredible to see her carry that forward in her career if she wants to. Uh, but I just hope wherever she ends up next, it's an environment that appreciates her. It's an environment that makes her feel like her voice is heard from the get go. It's an environment that allows her to thrive all the time. We said she's great at action. I could see her being a fantastic lawyer. Whatever kind of role she ends up playing next, I know she'll thrive, but I think just think the underlining point of it is I just hope that she feels appreciated at it because the biggest role of your career shouldn't take such a like draining effect on your life. And it's sad now to know from that that, that it, if they do that far. But the truth is she will be great at wherever she goes. But again, I just hope that she's happy, whatever she does. Yeah, I would even, I mean, because it's at this point, I'm going to, let's tentatively say The Flash season nine is it. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think it should be it. Um, though I know there are fans that want to get to season 10. Um, and if they do, that they do. Um, Candice might not be there, and that is fine too, mm -hmm. um, just because of everything that she's gone through. Um, but like, I do wonder, will she walk away from being in front of the camera? Like, will she do like what we said and be behind the camera um, producing? Um, wherever she goes, I definitely know I'm going to follow mm -hmm. um, to see what she's, she's doing next. I think, though, because it's been um, nearly a decade, there, for all she knows, she may not know this, there might be people coming up in the industry who actually learned from her of how you should do better. Um, I know that like, obviously other than like good home training and you've been taught to be mindful of the things that you, you say, um, speaking in the public sphere, especially on camera and anything that's recorded um, can be difficult. Like you don't know how to navigate it. And I've loved all the things that Candace has said over the years of uh, how to be mindful 
of the way your words can impact the situation, even if they seem harmless to you. Um, for instance, uh, I'm going to put this in a way that, so when the snowberries were gaining in um, attention, um, there were some of them that were a part of the snowberry movement because they didn't care for Iris and some of that was racist. And I'll acknowledge that there were some snowberries who simply just liked Caitlin and Barry. But in a situation in which there's a lot of toxicity, there's no need to lean in to what the snowberries want. And in an interview, Daniel Panamaker did do that. And I think in other situations that didn't involve your lead, that can be fine. Um, but when like the lead relationship is supposed to be Iris and Barry, um, there's really no room to, they can't hint, wink, wink, see what happens. Those fans, especially when the loudest of them only want it because they want Candace Patton out. And I think in that situation, it would have been better to pivot, mm -hmm. um, to, to talk about, to talk about West Allen instead. I think in any situation like that, if you're um, a co-star and you, you're aware of the harassment going on, that's the best thing to do is to pivot away from conversations that will lead into, will bleed into the toxicity that a fandom is experiencing. So when people are in comments saying, well, what can co-stars do? What can networks do? Like what would, what would be the appropriate response? Well, the appropriate response is to not feed into the topics that you already know are going to breed toxicity. It's important for networks to immediately shut things down. It's, a, it's important for as a unit, co-stars to be like, hey, this is not okay. In the way that the Obi-Wan Kenobi cast protected mm -hmm. Moses Ingram. Um, and I know fans were, some fans were mad because they were like, well, I'm not one of those people. I actually just don't really like um, Moses Ingram's character. And I'm talking about the writing and how I don't like that. I was like, okay, well then don't, you don't need to haul it because they weren't hitting <laughs> they, they were talking to the people who are doing this for racist reasons. And it's important for companies to come out and be like, we see what you're talking about online and we don't care for it and leave our stars alone. It's important for co-stars to, um, to drop videos online and to publicly state this will not be tolerated and we love this person and we protect this person. So if you're looking for us to engage with you in that way, that's not happening. Uh, being cognizant of the atmosphere is of the utmost importance. And if you're gonna be in the industry or you're already in the industry and you're trying to like navigate toxic waters of fandom, that's the best way to do it. Be aware of what's going on and don't feed into it. Um, and that's not like a, a slight against anybody who's done that and was just not aware. Like some people do that and they're just not aware of how bad it can get. Like, but once you're aware of it, don't do it anymore. Definitely. I think it's it's definitely a learning game. And without a doubt, people are learning and the importance is that they do learn. But I do think the Obi-Wan Kenobi example is a great example because the seeing seeing the videos that you and McGregor posted, that the 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 the, the, I, the backlash, I know that's a much bigger show, but the backlash, the 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 togetherness, the way the way they 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 bound together to stop that at its root, at its source it does highlight that the flash never really pulled that off. I know there were, I know that movement started to get off the ground multiple times. Some people stood up, some people didn't, but it, it never quite had the togetherness or the seamlessness that the Obi-Wan Kenobi movement did. And considering the flash is one of those shows where this whole diversity conversation, this whole, we need to protect our actors started with it's, it's disappointing in hindsight that it was never able to pull that off. I do think the CW is getting better, but it's not there yet. And it still has a long way to go. And I, but I'm not sure it would be in the better position. It is if stars like Candace hadn't spoken out in the first place. And the truth is that they shouldn't have really had to. So I do think everybody is learning, but it's important that we continue to learn and prevent things from like this happening, not just to future stars, but to, but to the ones that are still out there in the trenches talking about how it's still happening to them. It's important that everyone's voice feels heard and that nobody is subjected to that kind of online hatred again. Sure. And that also means showing us you need to come out for your, mm -hmm. for your stars. Um, and to write better for your stars. One of the things that Eric Wallace did promise for season nine was that the writing for Iris is going to be better. I hope that's the case because um, 
he received just criticism for the way that Iris's writing was handled, that the storylines were, were handled, including that whole debacle about um, Candace's four episodes that she missed, um, which she released on her Instagram that she was always available for episodes. So she let them know that she was. Um, the only thing that she wanted to make sure, and this is the plan her team put together, um, was that if the borders closed because of COVID again, she's not trapped in Canada. Uh, she spoke on that podcast about how much that harmed her mental health to not to be able to go home. And so she didn't want to be in the same situation again. So it wasn't just um, like, oh, again, all the people who didn't care for Candace or didn't care for Iris were like, oh, well, she wanted a break before episodes. Like, well, she didn't want to break before episodes. That's just what happened. That's what the, the decision behind the scenes was made, that I was going to be missed for four episodes. I believe there's an interview from, from Eric Wallace where he talks about um, it being a means of making it feel real that Iris is gone. I didn't feel like it felt real that Iris is gone. I felt like the they were too um, there's too much levity in places for her to be gone. Um, but that is what he said the impetus for the, for the decision was. And I don't want that to happen again in season nine. Um, especially because she said that season eight was going to be her last. She thought season eight was going to be her last. And if that was going to be um, Iris West Allen's last season, ooh, um, like we had a tragic start and we were going to have a tragic end too. Like, like just the, um, just what it came full circle with terribleness um, when it came to her, her storylines. And I do not like that. So I am happy that she's in season nine. Yeah, I want more for her in season nine. And I know that might sound selfish but the fact of the matter is what they did in season eight that four episode gap was completely unnecessary but the thing that made it worse was that they weren't utilizing her right before or after that so it really stood out when she wasn't in the episodes the fact that the show's writing got better when when she wasn't in the series or wasn't in the season that was disrespectful that should never have been allowed to happen and I would really appreciate if we never have to say the words time sickness ever, ever, ever again. Yes. Um, give her something worthy. And it's not just about sticking her in a storyline with Barry. This is not like, oh, a woman's storyline is only good when she's around a man. It's not that. But you could clearly see the effort they were going to, to keep her and Barry apart in season eight. And that hurt the story. So let them interact. Let them have those moments and let the leading lady and leading man actually share the screen together once in a while, because I don't just feel like that will benefit both of their stories. I feel like it will benefit. First of all, the performances with Grant and Candace are incredible together, but even more than that, it will benefit the overall show more because you could clearly see it was going to such an length to keep them apart. Just don't let that happen in season nine. Will you guys let me know if we see producer Grant Gustin and producer Candace Patton in the credits in season nine? Because it's like something well, that I'm dude. like, I'm like surprised that it hasn't happened yet. And I'm like, is it going to happen in the maybe final season? We will. Well, I would yeah, we'll screenshot it. We'll screenshot it and we'll make it the banner on the Twitter <laughs> just in celebration. Okay, just to round this out, um, I do want to say at least for now, one last hashtag, let Iris be great. Um, that was a movement that was started by Candy Kane's You on Twitter. Um, and she's, they've been very vocal. All the fans have been very vocal using that hashtag. And I'm assuming that's going to come back up when season nine airs again. But like, do that. Let her be great. She is already great. So let her be great on screen. Yes. I love that movement. Like, just like with the Iris West Defense Squad, it's wonderful to see what the fans can accomplish. And I hope there isn't as much of a need for it in season nine, but I will be super happy to see that hashtag again in season nine. And yes, I will be tweeting using it. But I would, I suggest starting it early. Once you see that they start like writing and filming, let's get on their necks yeah. early. Yeah. <laughs> right, Make their voices cool. heard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 not me putting a directive out there <laughs> you should though you're right get on the next early that's exactly what this should be done 